Hey everybody, it's Brian Heater, the hardware editor at TechCrunch.com. Uh, I'm supposed to tell you that coming up in the very near future, we have a uh, game of charades on stage here. But in the meantime, we are going to be speaking with Chet Kanogia, the CEO and founder of Starry Internet. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. This has to be an interesting show for you. You know, you don't have any physical product to show off. Uh, we don't. We, we do make physical products, but uh, we don't exhibit them at the trade show. But it's always good to be here. There's lots of interesting people, lots of interesting ideas. So we always come once at least. So it's more of kind of a, a networking show for you? Yeah, it tends to be more, you know, business and partners. So if, if you could actually start by telling us a little bit about the technology, if you could take us through a walkthrough. I know that you've been doing some, some limited demos for people out in Boston. Walk me through that experience. Uh, so the technology, I mean, fundamentally, and I think a lot of people are beginning to talk about 5G and, and where things are evolving to sort of the next generation of these networks. And, and uh, you know, there's some confusion that people equate 5G to millimeter wave spectrum. But fundamentally, what we're doing is think of it as pre-5G, 5G. And what we've done is uh, essentially used Wi-Fi as a basis and running Wi-Fi in licensed high-frequency bands to be able to have great throughput. So you can have a gigabit level service as a ISP down to a consumer's home. And we've developed a lot of sophisticated RF front end technology to be able to overcome traditional challenges that you face in high frequency spectrum to do, uh, to get effective range of like a kilometer and a half mm -hmm. uh, and still maintain a very high degree of modulation and, and get the right capacity out. It sounds like one of the primary benefits of the technology is that you don't really have to deploy infrastructure. You know, a, lot of these, a lot of these companies are working with um, fiber and, and internet. There's a lot of digging involved, but you're doing it all over the air. So uh, if you can string a wire, the wire will always win. The problem is it's just very expensive to string a wire, and yeah. it's very expensive to maintain it, and it takes a long time to do that. So it's not just expense, but time also it takes. And then the regulatory hurdles that are laid out uh, in our society further impede that. You know, you've got the federal government, you've got local and mini and state, and incumbents have different types of protection models in there. So that's why you don't see a whole lot of success at scale with wired infrastructure that is new. Legacy wired infrastructure, obviously very successful. So for the next generation of bandwidth capacity, low latency applications, you need a new type of an infrastructure, and that's going to be wireless. And so, you know, we started working on this about two and a half, three years ago, somewhere in that time frame. And now you're seeing everybody's beginning to talk about it, whether it's Verizon, your parent company, or AT&T. Yeah. And, uh, and that's sort of the next wave of the next five to ten years. You're going to see a tremendous amount of innovation and deployment in this uh, kind of a technology. So you looked at the existing ISPs out there and, and you saw an opening for, for the technology. Did, did the company, was the genesis of the company the technology, or was it the, the perceived problem? So we always start with what the market opportunity is, and then figure out what technology we can develop to fit that market opportunity. So for example, in wireless, we decided, you know, so, so if you think about it, one of the biggest costs is of building out wired infrastructure, and then you say, okay, how can I get lower cost? That yeah. means wireless, which leads to you saying, which kind of spectrum do I want to use where I can get sufficient blocks of bandwidth and that leads you towards a certain class of spectrum because all the lower bands have been eaten up by cellular and they're very expensive and not really suitable for these applications. So you start with that and you sort of back your way into, okay, aha, now this is what I need to build to take that market opportunity. So that's how I tend to do things as opposed to completely coming up with a new technology mm -hmm. and then finding an application for it. We've talked around it a little bit, uh, but if you can give me kind of a very base level overview of of how it works and, and what it looks like in person. Sure, so um, the, it's a relatively simple network. Uh, it's a star configuration. Mm -hmm. And basically our base stations, which cover about a kilometer range, kilometer and a half range, go on vertical assets, which are pre-existing, so basically existing cell towers, existing cell sites. Uh, and that's a tremendous advantage because you can, those things exist and yep. you can just rent and lease. And we deploy these base stations and they provide coverage down in the uh, deemed zones, and then we basically install uh, outdoor antennas that are smart antennas on the consumer's premise, and they come in different flavors. They're bigger ones for big buildings, or they're window mounts for single-family homes, uh, and so it's basically just that one air link that 
provides you the connection. The base stations have fiber backhaul or in-band um, millimeter wave backhaul as well. It it's a relatively like, safe, straightforward yeah. experience. It sounds like it's potentially sort of small scale, though. I mean, and certainly at the moment, it's rolled out to a very limited number of beta testers in Boston. Um, I, I believe the time frame is to have it rolled out wider in Boston by the end of the year. But is this something that's really going to work on a, a much larger scale? So these kinds of technologies are designed for metropolitan areas. So in cities, you will see hmm. this kind of an approach very rapidly deployed at scale. Uh, and not just the U.S., but globally as well. Uh, in rural, in, in broader, what I will say, middle of the country and smaller towns, rural, these approaches aren't necessarily the most appropriate. Different bands are used for that, yeah. so that's much more cellular-like, if you will. So yes, you will see, uh, yeah, clearly it's very small scale at the moment just because it's the first month of deployment, but yes. Uh, in cities, you will absolutely see this at scale. It's not going to be tomorrow, but you know, a few years, but yeah. This so, so the time frame is, is a few years? Single digit years, yeah. And you're going to be taking it city by city after Boston? Yeah, we, uh, not city by city, we, you know, our traditional, the, the approach that we, we picked Boston for a variety of reasons. One was that we're all, the engineering team is located yeah. there. But B, atmospheric conditions play a big role. So it's a lot easier to do these kinds of tests in, you know, let's call it Plano, Texas, or Austin, or uh, Dallas or where the or weather doesn't where change the weather at all. doesn't really change yeah. or Southern California uh, so we picked Boston because one of a, a, a concern in, in these bands is how well are you going to be hardened against snow and ice and and uh, you know rain in a particular format and so so we will learn hopefully a lot within Boston in the first year and in parallel we're building out about 16 additional cities as well and then we'll build out 16 in parallel it's interesting. So things like snow or extreme weather have the potential to really impact the the signal of the technology. If if there's, I know you know Boston gets its fair share of blizzards. If there's a blizzard outside, am I going to lose internet access? No. So uh, two things. So you design for this with margin. So basically, it all yeah. comes down to how much power you're radiating, uh, and at what le power level do you distort your signal. And that affects at what modulation rates that you're going to run. So you, uh, in free space, as they call it, we run about 10 kilometer length. But eight and a half of that is pure margin for essentially weather, rain, some foliage, certain refractions, reflections. So you basically design your link parameters to take all that into account. And mm -hmm. then you test against that to prove that whether you, what you thought you've designed for is, is true or not. So, so you, you, you kind so of... The I, net answer is yeah. no, it won't affect yours. Uh, internet connection because we've taken that into account. It, it sounds like you, you, you under-promise, over-deliver. That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> we hope we keep yeah. that. But you, know, you, you make sure that the, uh, the signal can reach further right. than, than what you, you put on a piece of paper. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not just us. It's you know, most standard sure. networks, uh, yeah, most operators do that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, ISPs, it, uh, you know, and I'm sure that you, you know this. I'm sure that, that you've, you've done all the research. Uh, it's a really it's it's a hard business to get into, because you're only going to hear feedback from people when the internet goes down. You know, you're not going to get a nice tweet from somebody saying, "Oh, my internet was really fast today." It's only those moments where you you lose your connection, where you really start to hear from the consumer. Well, that's a lot of utility businesses tend sure. to be in that uh, way. But I think you can take a look at this and, and try to change the experience. And uh, that starts with, you know, do you have to wait hours for an installer to come? Or do you have to, you know, does, you know, if the coverage was, let's, you know, let's say Superstorm Sandy happens yeah. and, and everything goes down, do you get a discount for the moments that you didn't have service or, you know? So, so uh, the new age companies that are consumer centric and consumer focused are really focused on that experience. And one of the things we did was we designed even the termination point of the network as, our Wi-Fi router in the home, the Starry Station, mm -hmm. and then we built that very specifically for our service, so that we have 24 near real-time information on what's going on at the edge of the network inside a consumer's home from a connectivity performance perspective. So it's not like we're we're, which is a huge departure from the current model, where you know a traditional ISP, you call them up and you say, you know, my Roku is buffering. They have no idea why your Roku is buffering, and yeah. they really shouldn't because they don't have any piece of equipment inside the home beyond the modem that they control, that they can actually help you with. When building from the ground up in the way that you are, you, you really have to have the foresight to take all of these things into account ahead of time. You know, you've been 
the company's been around for, for two years. Uh, I believe it really, it really started making it public around this time last, last year. year. Um, so you've been really focused on the technology and now that it's out in the real world, now that people are doing beta testing and you're looking for a full city time frame by the end of the year, you've got to start thinking about all of these different moving parts. Yes, um, operations is a, you know, these businesses are equal part technology, equal part marketing, and equal part operations because at the end of the day, you know, the most valuable thing is the consumer experience. Yeah. And customer care is an incredibly important aspect of it. Yeah, so all of those things, as you said, it's a hard, these are big businesses ultimately if you succeed at them, but they're hard, very hard. I suspect that probably one of the, the largest hurdles that you have at this point is convincing people that this is actually real. <laughs> a lot of the press I think that you've you've had up till this point is oh this is a really this is a great idea it's fantastic if it works but people are pretty skeptical how do you you know you come to shows like this you talk to us but how do you convince people that this actually works in the real world um, so it's not just I mean at this point it's not just us I mean every large operators talking sure. about you know whether it's Verizon sure or but you know to, people know that Comcast they can get it works done. right uh, <laughs> I mean, sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. No, no, no. And it, um, I think the, the, what it really is going to come down to just deployment and getting customers. And as that yep. starts happening, I think, uh, I think there was initially when we announced this, and by the way, we were staying under the radar and we intended to stay under the radar, but your fellow press people, diligent ones, dug up some information about yep. our, our licenses with the FCC and things like that. So the, uh, you know, the intention is to kind of just focus on grinding this to where there is a sustained amount of customer traction, which can then speak for itself. Uh, and when we announced, people were like, well, there's no way millimeter waves are going to go yeah. a kilometer or a kilometer and a half or whatever it is. And then as people started understanding what we were really doing, that debate has gone away, right? Mm -hmm. Nobody's sort of complaining about that part now. Uh, and it's just a progression. I, I, I suspect the part of the skepticism was you know, the fact that obviously uh, giant companies like Google have tried their own angle. You know, they've got, they've got fiber, they've got weather balloons, they, they've attempted to do this before. So people are wondering how a company with as many incredibly smart people as Google haven't been able to pull this off, but you, a two-year-old startup, have it in the real world right now. Yeah, I mean, time will tell, right? <laughs> but, but what... Tesla what, was a bunch of... Young sure. guys running around and they, you know, created a fabulous car and, uh, you know, yeah. they, they didn't have any military experience or rocketing experience and they, you know, started blasting. It's, it's, it's good engineers. It's okay. good engineers, good focus, access to capital and, uh, you know, everybody starts somewhere. Yeah. So, so you expect that now that, now that this technology is out there and people know what it is, that there's going to be a lot of competition? Um, I think in 10 years, you're probably going to have four to five choices is mm -hmm. my sense. Great. Chet, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, thank you, everybody. And uh, coming up next, we've got some TechCrunch charades. Thank you.